everything that go along with it, I'm cut off completely. In fact, this little get up I'm in now, this is like, I usually got the, you know, I usually got the monkey suit on, I look like coming out of Dachau, Treblinka someplace, you know, with the stripes and all that. I, I haven't seen anything like this since I come in here. I've been here over a year and a half. You know, I get nothing, period. I'm in the control unit. This is Pennsylvania's Marriott. This is like the new joint in Colorado. It's the premier control unit for the whole state. Russell Maroon Schultz, a former Black Panther from Philadelphia, has been a prisoner for the last 25 years in Pennsylvania's maximum security cell blocks. Today he is held in the new Maxi Maxi prison in Wurzburg, the same prison cell block where Mumia Abu Jamal is held. This prison is located at the farthest corner of the state, near the West Virginia border, far from family, children, making visits from loved ones difficult, almost impossible. The interview was conducted by Daruba Bin Wahad, who spent 19 and a half years in prison on charges of which he was innocent and was released only because it was found that the prosecution withheld information of his innocence from his defense attorneys. And your situation has been unique. You and other political prisoners uh, uh, have been treated differently. Uh, how long have you been in isolation, in this form of isolation? I've been in isolation within these 24 years, over 16 or 17 years. Not straight. Off and on. But oh, off and on, I've been in isolation. And, and it was because of his politics as a panther that Russell Maroon Schultz has been persecuted inside the prisons. Cruel and unusual punishment by a gracist criminal justice system where the numbers of prisoners mainly from the black and latin communities are growing at an explosive rate since this interview was taped the pennsylvania prison system has banned the electronic media in order to cover up the injustices such as the terms of confinement of russell maroon Schultz. so actually it's two joints for real it's one joint that's uh, a regular penitentiary that's out there. But everything behind these walls, you know, the building that Mumi is in, which is uh, the death row building, and the building I'm in, they're all identical. But they just, they're, they're, they're cut off, cut and run. I'm in the control unit, cut and run. And I'm being told that I will never leave here. How much time do you have out yourself? Uh, an hour a day. 23 hours a 23 hours. Uh, three showers a week, five hours of outdoor recreation, and that's it. The unit is completely self-contained. Everything that's done is done on the unit. The meals are bought in, they're preparing, they're bought in. Everything else is done right on the your unit. Meals, your meals are served in the cell? They're served right in the cell. So, they build, so, so you don't come out even to eat? I don't come out for anything except one hour, five days a week to exercise. And what's that, that's a dog cage or something? That's like a dog cage, single capacity dog cage, 12 foot fences, concertina wire, walls around the entire unit. So that's there is a common mythology about prisons that suggests that, you know, these are country clubs. The politicians would have you believe that. Of course, nobody's rushing to come in here or that. Um, imagine, if you will, doing life in your bedroom, and I mean 22 hours, 22 or 23 hours as is here now, a day, and another hour in a cage, you know. Um, I invite any broadcaster, yourselves included, to tour, not the, just the visiting facilities, but to tour cells, to tour cages, and to look at it from that perspective, you know. Um, there are different kinds of prisons in different states and different systems. There are some that are, of course, worse than others. There are some that are better than others. But all prisons are prisons and are by their very nature hell holes, you see. And when you talk about the reality of death row, where someone is serving not a sentence, but uh, a timeless sentence until their death, and you talk about a special kind of hell, 
a special kind of hell that is reserved for some people and off limits for others. These United States have become the greatest gulag in the world by far. More than a million of our young men, overwhelmingly our young men, rounded up as a means of social control, pure and simple. And all that talent and energy and imagination that ought to be home with us, destroyed and brutalized. It doesn't have to happen. We had a moratorium on prisons in the 60s. <coughs> we have to have a moratorium on new prisons now and a reduction of existing prisons. We have seen a quadrupling, a near quintupling of the prison population in the last 20 years since the Attica Prison Rebellion, which was a protest against overcrowding. And we had 12,500 prisoners in the New York State system. We now have 65,000. And the state hadn't even grown. And we're calling for more. God help us in that madness. Let me ask you something, uh, Russell. You, you've, been in, you've been in prison how long now? Uh, 24 plus years. 24 plus years. That's correct. And since the time you've been in a uh, 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 prison, uh, have you noted a, a, a decided shift in, first of all, the, um, the, the, the inmate population in their consciousness and, 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 and the way the Department of Correction goes about um, uh, administering the prison system? And well, the primary shift that I've noticed since I've been in the prison is the overwhelming numbers of prisoners who've come in the system. Presently, just within the state system, not counting the local systems, Presently, within the state system, they got over 30,000 prisoners. When I first came here, there was less than 4,000 prisoners in this system. In Pennsylvania? In Pennsylvania, it was less. I got that wrong. It was less than 5,000 prisoners within the Pennsylvania system. Now it's over 30,000 prisoners. That's the major change. Um, the makeup of the prisons has always essentially been the same in this state, which is roughly 60 or more percent black possibly five or more percent Hispanic, and then the rest, you know, were white. So that makeup is basically the same. However, this large influx of prisoners have radically changed how the prison system has been handled. When I first come to prison within this system here, the prison system was lock us up, but basically the treatment was relatively, although they holding us captive, you could at least get the things that you need. Nowadays, or with, at least within the last eight or nine years, because that's when, the, that's when the large influx begin to come in. Now, you can't even get clothing you need. About all you can get nowadays is enough to eat. Well, Actually, this is the premier control unit for the whole state. And you know, what's the population? All together is 386 you know, these uh, maxi maxi cells. But out of 386 men, you will probably never see but 24 men that's in on your unit, in addition to the officers, as well as maybe two workers. You know, they may come from another unit. That's about it. I've been here a little over a year and a half. And within that time, I've seen Brother Mumia twice. And I've been able to holler at him and say, how you doing? once within that time. And at one time, we were in the same identical building for six months. And he was telling me. And that was... And you could be in the same say. building, won't even know somebody's there, yeah. yeah. So that's the whole idea about, you know, how they're making these new control units. It's to, come, come, you know, completely cut you off as much as possible from all of the, you know, outside stimuli that they can. Also within this unit, you know, we're not allowed to uh, have access to uh, our own reading material. We're not allowed, you know, we have you to mean, read the... You, you never permitted books? No, we're permitted access to books within their library. They provide a library, which is everything from the boy who invented popcorn or bubble gum or up to some other crap, some system crap that they want you to read. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You can't order books from the publisher or... No, you're not. You can order what you want. But when it comes, it goes into your property to be given to you when you're released. And in the case of a person like me, I've been told over and over again in writing that I will never, any VBR, 
be released from this unit. And of course, as you know... So you say all the books that you're sending are put in your property and you never get to read them? No, you, you're never allowed the books except from approval from their board, which is the Program Review Committee. Okay, it's so the they say for instance your book was sent to you right. from the publisher. It goes right. to the Program Review Committee. It goes to the Program Let's Review Committee. Let's assume that they are okay. Right. Then you can read it. Then you can read it. Okay, so you can have it in your cell. You would have it in your cell in exchange for another book. Another book. So you're permitted, how many books in your cell, five? No, what you're permitted, you're permitted, you're permitted the necessary legal books for cases that you're preparing as well as any one religious book. Um, outside of that, your leisure reading material, something that's sent from somebody on any given topic, you're only allowed it if the program review committee approves it. So as it stands right now, and I've been here a year and a half, and I've been given access to being able to exchange two books on a one-for-one -one basis. And this is because I haven't had any type of rule since 1989. So you can imagine what I would have to do, you know, uh, to work myself into, you know, some more access to... Uh, so, so therefore, your reading, your ability to read um, different diverse material is, 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 uh, is restricted at best. Yes, it has to come through the PRC. I'll give you an example. Um, about six months ago, my daughter had me send a dissertation that was by a, a Kim Holder, which is a graduate student. He got a PhD on this dissertation. And it was on the history of the Black Panther Party. Yeah, I see it, yeah. And uh, the Program Review Committee reviewed it and refused to let me have access to it. No reason, because they don't have to give a reason, because all of this is discretionary. And they make a determination on what you should read and shouldn't read. They make a determination on everything they is should do. Is there a criteria they're supposed to utilize? And if there is a criteria, but the criteria is so broad that it gives them wide latitude to determine everything within your life except a limited number of things. And amongst those limited number of things, of course, they have to provide for your safety. They can't kill you. They can't allow anybody else to outright kill you except in a limited number of reasons, such as in the case of the state, or to prevent you from, you know, bringing deadly harm to somebody else. What has the pretext been for putting you in isolation? Is that I'm just a, too much of a danger to the overall system. Well, I mean, that's vague. Aren't all prisoners a danger to the system? Well, in my case in particular, I've escaped more than once, and I've attempted to escape more than once. Oh, I so see. they always use the escape oh, I see. mainly. You, you have one of them Kunta Kente complexes. I absolutely have a Kunta Kente. <laughs> My name is Maroon. I'm about, I'm not about staying in a, you, you know, in an oppressive about, situation. You ain't about staying still. Hell no. <laughs> you know, anybody who sits up a prison and don't try to go. I know, we was trying to sit you down just now. I said, you yeah, said you more know, comfortable staying. That's out the question. They don't, they, they, they must don't know what the guns and guards and, and fences and wire, wire and all that crap is for. Well, which, which, I might add to that, which is not really extraordinary, you know, because if, 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 if my situation was so extraordinary, not saying that, you know, uh, I'm not in a category, you know, that's outside of the normal category, because they don't have that many people within this whole system who escape successfully, you know, on more than one occasion. However, the prison systems were built specifically to keep people here by force. Yeah. So that is uh, that is actually a part of the overall dynamic. Well, that, and that, fact, that was a facility that they built for guys like me because I'm amongst that small percentage, and most of that percentage, who whether they are escape risk or they other their other risk that ordinarily that they feel as though that they cannot allow within the general populations within the other prisons because they weren't secure enough, they built this prison specifically for that, according to their own words and their documents and whatnot. And I was sent here, in fact, I was told as far back as 1991, I was told at that time I was in isolation also. And I was in the courts and otherwise, asking why with my behavior adjustment, which was no infractions, period. Because other than wanting to go home, I'm about in prison. You know, because I don't see any reason to be involved in any type of infraction with anybody except for my own safety or whatever, something of that nature. 
So in light of the fact that I was a model prisoner, I wanted to know, the courts wanted to know, my relatives wanted to know, people who was concerned about me wanted to know how come I could not be released from the isolation. And I was told each time that each institution, that there was no institution in the whole state system that they felt within their judgment that would be safe for me, but they was building a new institution, State Correctional Institution in Green. And once this place was built, shortly afterwards, I came in January 95 with the understanding that, you the be released to that I would be released, assuming that I maintained my good, you know, yeah. behavior record. Have you applied to be released to, um, in general, did you make I've applied to be released to general population each of my 30-day reviews. Uh, oh, they have a routine 30-day review. They review me every 30 days, and each 30-day review that I attend, and I attend most of them, I ask the same thing for the record, for allowing me to be released. However, on my first review that I came here, I asked to be released, and I was told in no uncertain terms that I would never be released there, at which time I brought up. Who told you, know, you that? I was told that by the deputy warden in Barnum. He's the deputy warden of operations or something? Yeah, he's the deputy warden of operations. He's mainly the top security man outside of the superintendent or the warden. Do you, is, is that unusual? Uh, that an inmate, that a, that a prisoner is told that they would never be released despite the fact that the, 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 the system, the Department of Corrections has a policy requiring objective review of, of, of the uh, inmate status. And, but he's told from the onset that this is basically a formality and he's never going to be released. Is that, is that unusual? Are there other inmates that are told that? Well, it's not unusual to me because I've heard a little bit of everything since I've been in prison. But for purposes of the law, it's highly unusual because even that is outside of the wide parameters that they're given by all the laws and, the, and, and all the regulations that I'm familiar with. That well, there's know, no people, such thing as a, a forever thing with any type of, uh, in any status, within the correctional system. Well, you know, people have the impression that in the United States that the prison system is run based on some type of legal criteria that the uh, employees of the prison system are constrained by rules, that there's regulations that inmates must follow, and that if inmates follow the necessary rules, they're afforded certain privileges and certain concessions. If they don't, they're punished. And you're, what you're saying, and, and what, we hear you, what we hear you saying is that, in effect, except for the escape attempts that you have, which all prisons are designed to thwart, uh, and that's the nature of prisons, to thwart escape attempts, that aside from that, you've been a model prisoner, but yet here you are in the maximum control unit within a maxi-maxi prison, handcuffed in a non-contact cage, uh, based on your history in this system and not on your actual conduct? Is that what you're saying? That's absolutely the case. Do you think that's connected to, um, to your politics and to why you came to prison for the Well, not only is it connected to my politics, but it goes a little beyond that. Uh, in fact, uh, I have been in the prisons with the top administrators of this prison when they weren't top administrators. In other words, I've seen them come up through the ranks because I've been here as long as most of them, you know, and more than, as long as any of them, more than most of them. Let's just put it that way. And formerly, I've had contact with some of these top administrators. And in fact, I've had literally bodily you know, uh, contact with some of these administrations. In fact, I escaped from one penitentiary, and one of the administrators, uh, I was holding him hostage for a while. I didn't do any harm to him. I just didn't want him to get in the way of my attempt to leave the institution. The status of your case now. Uh, you've been in jail um, uh, over two and a half decades. Uh, what is the status of your case now? The status of my case is that I'm serving two life sentences, uh, 19 and a half to 38 years, five to 10, one to two, and three and a half to seven. And all of these are running consecutive, which means that I have to finish each, one. each sentence before I would begin another one. In Pennsylvania, life, it's natural life. There's no years on life. The only way you can get rid of a life sentence within Pennsylvania, you have to be commuted. You have to get a commutation that's got to be signed directly from the government. Uh, since I've been in this uh, system in this time, uh, 
outside of some juvenile years where I was in juvenile institutions, um, the commutations that were given out does not amount to my knowledge to 100 prisoners. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of lifers over this 20 some years. So the commutation as a general rule is not really something that a life prisoner can look forward to. I don't know what the future holds. Because as I said, when I first come to prison, it was only 5,000 prisoners. And it was a relative smaller percentage of lifers then. Now there's thousands and thousands of lifers because there's thousands of more prisoners. So I don't know whether or not that, you know, these prisoners will be offered commutation. And as far as myself, I doubt very seriously whether I have any type of chance for any type of commutation from this governor who happens to be one of those supposedly tough on crime political governors or any other governor for the simple reason that my case originally is in relationship to the killing of a Philadelphia policeman. And it's highly unlikely in my way of thinking that they would release anybody on commutation who has got anything to do, you know, with the killing of a, of a law officer. So my two lives and my other um, years that I got, uh, although I constantly fight, and I've been fighting in 20 some years, uh, I doubt very seriously whether there's any possibility of me ever leaving this system through the court system. Well, you know, now, today, the issue of police brutality and, uh, and the treatment of, uh, of national minorities by the police uh, are once again in the news and it's becoming an issue. Uh, and like you said, you were convicted of, 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 of a police uh, murder. Uh, do you think that your, your involvement in the Black Panther Party was the reason why you were convicted of this, as opposed to concrete evidence that you had anything to do with this? Well, possibly, probably. I have uh, numerous FBI files that I received through the Freedom of Information and Privacy Act that says right on the face of them that my case was targeted specifically by the then, uh, you know, ahead of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. My case, uh, I was mentioned by name. I have at least close to 800, 800 pages of these files, and I could probably get thousands of pages, but I was not ever allowed access to them without the money, and I don't have the money to buy them. But I could see crystal clear by the files that I got that I was absolutely targeted by the Department of Justice through its Federal Bureau of Investigation Director to give specific hands-on direction as to what should be done with my case. So the reason I say possibly is because I don't know just what all was done in relationship to my case and what, you know, my defense that I put forth. I don't know because I don't have access to these documents. But what I do have is people who, in other words, I don't have any federal charges, period. I never did have any federal charges. However, the director of the FBI, he got involved, of course, in my case because I was being sought on unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, which is a federal case. But as soon as I was captured, that was dropped. So nominally, there was not supposed to be any type of uh, federal input. Nevertheless, I got these files where it shows that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, through its director, was into my case all the way up to, I don't know how far it goes, but it goes beyond the point where I was arrested and I was being tried. So I don't know what's there. I don't know without that, whether or not, you know, something well, is I mean, or whatever. Are you, are you familiar with, uh, with the Federal Bureau of Investigations program called uh, PRISAC, Prison Activist Program? Absolutely. Um, do you know that this was a national program in which they trained uh, state and local law enforcement Absolutely. correctional uh, officials in, into uh, how to deal with political activists such as yourself. Do you think that you were targeted under this price act while you were in uh, Pennsylvania custody? Pennsylvania? I couldn't say specific whether I was or not because I would have to have some documents to corroborate my ideas. But I do know this. I know that since the first day I've ever come in this system, outside of my attempting to liberate myself, and to go home by escape and any other means, I have always been treated differently. And so, and, and so you were in federal custody for a period of time? I was in the federal custody for close to a year and a half. 
So they allowed me into the general population, which I stayed, which is the first time I've been in the general population since 1983. You didn't have any trouble while you were in general I had absolutely no trouble at all. In fact, I was one of them so-called quote unquote model prisoners, which meant that I went to school, I went to work, I minded my business. So this was basically the only time you've been in general population was when they tried to get rid of you out of the state system and send you to the feds, and the feds found out that they were uh, bamboozled by the yes. state, and they put you in general population, Correct. and then the state took you back. So as soon as I was returned, I was immediately put back into put back in the hole. My work and my school and my other adjustment record at the federal penitentiary, and I was in the general population, and I collected all these things and I presented them when I returned to the institution that they sent me. But of course, they knew they knew why they had sent me, so they wasn't really concerned with what I said when I come back. So I was locked up there. The only thing I was told is what I mentioned earlier: that look, we're building an institution for guys like you, and once that's built. You will be allowed to be in the, you know, regular general population. That was 1991. So once I come up here in 1995, I've come to find that was a sham also. It seems like you've been through uh, hell and back. You think that, um, you don't think that there's a campaign that's possible to change, at, at the very minimum, change your prison status? Um, it is my firm conviction. First of all, have you ever bought a lawsuit? Or any type of legal action about your uh, about your about your status? Uh, I've been bringing legal actions for the last 20 years. In fact, within that time, I've become a pretty accomplished jailhouse lawyer. I constantly bring legal actions on my behalf and other people's behalf. But this never does anything in my case. It did. helps other people, but it never helps me. I'm being kept here for two basic reasons. I truly believe. And those are, one of them is personal vindictiveness. I'm deemed as someone who will always attempt to do something positive on the part of the prisoners. Because as I stated, I've become a pretty accomplished jailhouse lawyer, not because I thought that this would ever have me released from the prison system, because I don't really think it will. But I've become a accomplished jailhouse lawyer because I want I, I see that in order for me to stop the worst abuses, that were occurring with myself and the other men who I was in sympathy with in the institution, I had to be able to put the long arm of the law on the people who were breaking the law. So I learned the law just specifically for that reason. Mm -hmm. in, in, in trying to do the work around political prisoners, one of the things that, one of the problems that we encounter again and again, the incredulous uh, 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 attitude that people have when we tell them about cases like yours, with brothers and sisters, brothers who have been in prison over 25 years um, in the United States. Uh, most people don't have a history, understanding of this history, and they don't have an understanding that the political prisoners exist. I'm not really concerned about myself or people like me. Of course, I'm being brutalized of what not century and perceptual deprivation. However, we have much, much more pressing situations in mind. We have the case of Mumia Abu Jamal. Mumia Abu Jamal has successfully exposed so much, so many inconsistencies about the criminal justice system. If our communities, if the if if, if the people who are aware.